Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything. everything. Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Sylvia Chan Malik, who is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University and the author of Being Muslim, A Cultural History of Women of Color in American Islam, published by New York University in 2018. How are you doing? I'm Professor good. Chandler? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. How did you come to this project? Oh, it was a long time in the making. So that's a story. There's a story of the actual book and the writing, and then yeah. there's a story of how I came to the topic. So I don't know which one that I should will be, both. Will I'll, be try to, I'll try yeah. to weave them together. Um, the book grew out of my dissertation work. Um, I was uh, uh, working. At, uh, at UC Berkeley in the Ethnic Studies Department. Mm -hmm. And I started grad, sc grad school in August 2001, two weeks wow. before 9-11. <laughs> and prior to that, um, I had been working as a journalist, covering culture and music in the Bay Area, and also working as an activist. Oh. So doing a lot of work in the West Token public schools and things like that. So I had been involved in kind of thinking through how to connect different communities yeah. in that yeah. area already. And so when I got into graduate school in the Ethnic Studies Department, which is, you know, always has an emphasis on advocacy and activism as part of its pedagogical practice, um, I went in thinking I wanted to do work connecting communities more, primarily Asian American and African American communities, yeah. because it was still 2001. We were still very much thinking about the post Los Angeles uprisings, kind of communities and trying to connect yeah. um, different groups together. But then, like I said, 9 11 happened. And it was in that moment that as an activist and as an advocate for different communities, we jumped into action trying to organize events around Muslim communities in the Bay Area at the time. And very quickly, just doing that work, I realized that there were these um, very distinctive racial and ethnic uh, groupings within the Muslim community. So in Oakland, California, where I'm from, you have the Nation of Islam, right. a very strong African-American Muslim community there. But then you have non-black Muslims, you have Yemeni shopkeepers, you have a lot of South Asian immigrants, right. and none of them seemed to be communicating or talking or had really communicated prior to this event. Right and on 9/11, and in that moment, what happens? They you get know? all forced together. Yeah, it's yeah. like the light, the 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 spotlight is shining. Who's the Muslim? Who's going to yeah. speak for this community? And everyone's looking at each other like, "Are you going? Are you going? Are you going?" Yeah. And what happens, of course, in that moment is that a lot of the more you know, people with more access to resources and things like that come to rise to say, "Oh, I am the spokesperson." Right for the Muslim community. And what happens in a lot of that is that African-American Muslims who have been here and working and doing you know, the hard work of building community. For almost a century. It, oh, more than that, right? Get sidelined. So I noticed this you know, right away. And so this is where you know, I started to think about my research. Try, I had been trying to connect black mm -hmm. and Asian communities and also Latinx communities in the area. But I thought, huh. How do I think about building conversations between the communities within this one highly scrutinized religious community at this moment? And it kind of led me, it, it, it segued or it kind of coalesced with my own interest, interest in Islam as a religion. Um, and so I kind of embarked on this new journey, you know, kind of spiritually, um, intellectually. Uh, culturally, kind of learning about all these things. And as someone who had a background in race and ethnic studies, that piece was always central to trying to understand yeah. what this thing called Islam was and is in the United States. I mean, one of the things you argue in the book is that when we think about the presence of Islam, particularly historically in the U.S., it's almost always connected to a black protest tradition. Absolutely, right? And, and that's what I, I, I had a term in the early stages of the dissertation that I've, you know, still wrestle with. You know, I call it this foundational blackness yeah. of Islam in America. Because I think about the presence of Islam um, amongst enslaved Africans. So, for example, anywhere from one-fifth to one-third of enslaved Africans came from predominantly Muslim countries on right. the coast of, uh, on, in West Africa. Right? So that presence was there, even though they weren't able to practice or kind of organize as Muslims. They still retained right. those practices and those belief systems and how they 
ate and how they congregated and how they you know, built kinship, right? So that presence lives on, and I, and I argue in the book and elsewhere, that that continually emerges and repeats itself, in not only in how Muslim communities constitute themselves in the United States, but in how Islam is marginalized, demonized, other. It's not just because it's a foreign, kind of exotic, orientalized religion. It's also because it's deeply rooted in anti-blackness. I, I mean, to your point, there's a way in which black American Muslims have been almost erased in the U.S. conversations about mm -hmm. Islam. Um, and, and if you think about the erasure of black American Islam, what does that same thing mean for women? within Islam, uh -huh. uh, particularly women of color and black women. And, and so, so much of the focus of your book really is on what are the gender dynamics of this. Uh, so how do you get to the, how did you get to the gender piece? Right, so as I started looking at this history, right, so you know, scholarship kind of goes in phases. You kind of yeah. have to learn this big thing and then you kind of say, oh, I'm really interested in this. And yeah, then you no kind of, like, who hasn't written about this or what stories need to be told? And I was trained as a cultural and literary uh, uh -huh. studies scholar, but as I did this project, I realized I had to become a historian, I had to become an ethnographer, you gotta be I had to do, you know, I had to be an oral historian, I had yep. to do all of those things because I could not just rely on text to do this work. And as I started to look at the debates, kind of the most animating, contentious debates, both within Muslim communities, um, in, in contemporary Muslim communities, but also historically, the issue of women and women's bodies was also always just right there mm -hmm. in the middle, whether it was something that people took up or not. You know, and so for example, in the first chapter of the book, I have this picture of four African American Muslim women in 1920s Chicago. On the, yeah, yeah, on the yeah. south side of Chicago, right? And that picture gets circulated in so much of the existing scholarship on yeah. history, on uh, the history of Islam in the United States, but no one ever asks who those women are, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? And so as someone who is very much engaged with, you know, black feminism and women of color feminism and who was trained in an ethnic studies department where we're always asking like, where is the presence of the women? Right. Where are the women of color? You know, the women doing the work, what were they doing? You know, as someone who was trained to think like that and look at things like that and who has worked with the communities, that was the first thing I started asking when I was looking at this history, like, oh, the women were clearly there. I mean, look at this picture. Right. And you use this picture and you never ask who these women are and why they were Muslim and how they figured out how to be Muslim. So someone needs to do that. Right, and so the the reason I came to women, kind of as the story I wanted to tell was deeply personal. Again, in one way, you know, I have daughters. My husband is a second generation African American Muslim, um, and I wanted a story. Yeah. You know, I wanted to tell right. the story of my mother in law and my his aunties and his right. grandparents. You know, these people, yeah. and then at the at the same time, I wanted my daughters to have a story that they could you know, connect look at and, and connect and say, this right. is our history. Yeah. So on, that's the personal piece, but on the other piece, it was just like, it, it, it's always infuriating when you're like, why doesn't anybody else care about who these women are? You mentioned <laughs> the kind of domestic life of, of black women within the nation of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so many times we'll see photos of Elijah Muhammad's speeches, Malcolm X speeches, to some extent Farrakhan speeches, and of course they're separated <laughs> in the way that they're seated, and you see these beautiful black women dressed in white. Mm -hmm. um, we're hard pressed to think of any nation of Islam, women ministers who have emerged to the fact that we even know <laughs> their names, right? They've been some ways rendered hyper visible in this imagery of the right. nation of Islam, but invisible and silent within the same context. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, they're iconic, right? That kind of um, uh, photograph of Gordon Parks, Gordon Parks photograph yeah. of the famous kind of sea of women in white yeah. habits at the Savior's Day Parade, yeah. um, you know, during the Nation of Islam gatherings. You know, we see that, and that connotes something. And I think there's so much, so there's so many different types of desires that are attached to that picture, you know, on the part of black nationalist struggles yeah, and yeah. kind of the gender politics, the often very problematic and fraught gender politics within national, right. cultural nationalist black struggle. Respectability. Right, you know, women needing to be pure, as Elijah yeah. Muhammad said, women needing to be the field for the <laughs> nation, you yes. know, to grow a strong black nation, yeah. right? And so this kind of sea of white absolutely connotes that. And then at the same time, again, and I wanted to connect 
those types of images, you know, Gordon Parks' images of women in the nation, with contemporary um, ideas and notions and images of oppressed Muslim women, right? This idea that Muslim women are oppressed. And it seems to me that for many um, uh, scholars now, they'll kind of connect that back. Oh, the women in the nation of Islam were oppressed because of Islam. Right. right, and so there's so much more context and framing that's necessary to understand the ways in which. So, so I have this concept of insurgent domesticity <laughs> about the women in yeah. the nation, where they were kind of actively practicing these domestic, you know, kind of uh, ways of housekeeping and cleaning as a way a of resistance, yeah. right? To say, you know, we are part of the struggle and this is what we're doing and it's very insurgent and yeah. it's very rebellious. I, I think about Ashley Farmer's work and mm -hmm. we're starting to see all this emergent work now talking that within broadly black nationalism, the way that black women cultivated a space to push about gender equality, to, to assert themselves, and at the same time not to destabilize you know, what this looks like publicly in terms of black nationalism. Right. Um, it, it makes me think of two points in thinking about the N NOI in particular. Um, you quote it, Ula Taylor, right, mm, of course, yeah. who's written a great book on the women mm -hmm. in the nation of Islam, and folks asking these questions, just as you suggested, why would women be compelled to be drawn to Islam or the nation of Islam, given the fact that, at least the way that we publicly think about it, it's constraining you know, the ability for, for black women to assert themselves. And you make the point that it was always about something more, right? What attracted the black folks to say an organization like Nation Islam was never so much the religious aspect of it, but what it meant in a secular world. Yes, and I, but I actually think it's actually both. There was that kind of religious desire for to understand that there was a greater purpose, that there was a yeah. higher power there. Spiritual, right. Yeah, spiritual purpose. And also, I mean, we also we also often talk about the nation of Islam in parochial terms, kind of very domestic, insular terms, but they were always a transnational organization Absolutely. in terms of building connections with Africa and the Middle East, the Asiatic black man. Right. right? Kind of thinking about the ways in which black Americans themselves were transnational the citizens. The way that Farcon tried exactly. to connect with Omar in the 80s and things of that nature. Exactly. Yeah. So I think in that piece, you know, the women also were kind of thinking we have sisters, you know, in continents yeah. all over the world. We are part of a global community, which is also kind of part and parcel of other early uh, African American Muslim movements like the Moorish Science Temple or the Ahmadiyya movement. Kind of this the idea that black Americans are not confined by the nation, yeah. you know, that they are exceeding and always kind of universal. Talk about Sonia Sanchez in this ah, particular okay. mix. Yeah, yeah so, so, so one of the fascinating things, and I got this from um, Eula Taylor's work, was that she asked this question in one of her early essays looking at the nation of Islam, like, why would anybody join the nation yeah. after Malcolm X's death, you know, after his assassination and all the kind of controversy surrounding it? Um, and, 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 you know, as, as all this criticism of it, Right. had come about in the press and in, in popular culture, you know, the hate that hate produced, right? right? So Sonia Sanchez joins the Nation of Islam in 1972, right. right, or something, you know? The height of the black arts movement, Baraka and everybody, yeah. they're already moving on to, away from the nation, or away right. from black nationalism into orthodox Sunni Islam. Right, and Baraka's moving towards Marxism. Exactly, he's moving towards right. Marxism. But Sonia, Sister Sonia, joins the nation at that point <laughs> because she says, I have these sons, right. and the nation is the most viable place, you know, I see them being the most proactive about helping kind of communities and people like me uh, have safety and protection for discipline. our families, discipline, right? And I had the wonderful honor of being in fellowship with Sister Sonia at the Schomburg, mm. um, you know, two, I can remember two or three years ago, right? Yeah. And she talked about this. Right, that they had the structure, they had the manpower, literally manpower, right. 
to have these spaces of safety. Eventually, she left because she said she, you know, she's an artist. She was wanting right. to do dance and do creative right. do things, things right. and she felt restricted. And ultimately, she felt like it was not the right place for her. But in that moment, I mean, that's a really powerful thing that she said this was a place of safety. And it was a place of validation. And it was a place in which she said, we as black women could find solidarity and sisterhood with one another that was spiritual, right. that was political, that was cultural. It was holistic, yeah. right? It kind of spoke to, it spoke to us as mothers. It spoke to us as political you know, advocates. It spoke to us as spiritual people. It right. spoke to every aspect. And I think that was always Elijah Muhammad's, you know, that was kind of the genius of the Nation of Islam <laughs> in certain ways, right? The appeal was that it spoke to every, it was a lifestyle. Right. It was an ideology. It was a political doctrine. It and was it an was economic. <laughs> it was, there was an economic structure. There was employment. Um, and then there was the religious and spiritual piece as well. It spoke to every aspect of people's lives right. in some way. And so for her, it was absolutely that. Um, and you know, there were many women who joined, who kept joining the for nation those reasons, yeah. for those very reasons. And you hear that uh, when when I've done interviews and things. You know, people will t women will talk about. You know, we were able to be leaders in the nation. We did rise up. We did have a voice. It was, and we enjoyed not being in the spotlight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're watching Left of Black. We're here with Professor Sylvia Chan Malik, who's Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. We're talking about her new book, The In Muslim. Um, one of the things that you talk about, and you know, it's ambivalence is probably too light of a term, but the relationship that women of color in Islam, black women in Islam, have to feminism. Yes. And the uh, the ways that they push back against it. Talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So the relationship, I, I argue in the book that women, and in particular women of colors, African-American women's engagements with Islam in the United States has always been impelled and driven by a desire for gender justice. Yeah whether you call that feminism or, feminism or not. And what we've come to call feminism, you know, when, when I ask my students, like, what is feminism? They'll be like, oh, you know, equal pay, abortion rights, you know, right. sexual freedom, things like that. I mean, we're talking about second wave, kind of white mainstream, right. Betty Friedan, right. Right. Uh, 1960s, 1970s feminism, right? So they kind of take that and use that as the template for what feminism is. And so for Muslim women, black and non-black, these particular notions of Western-based feminism, right. right, have consistently been used to dehumanize and marginalize the ways in which they are always desirous of gendered agency through Islam. Right? And so this dates back, so there's different strains here. This dates back to the colonial occupation yeah. uh, of Egypt. Right? You see Leila Ahmed, wonderful scholar Leila Ahmed, who's at Harvard Divinity School, argues that you know, it's in her classic work, uh, Women and Gender in Islam, that this idea of the veil, you know, this colonial discourse in the veil comes up during uh, British occupation of Egypt, in which British men who have women, you know, who are wearing corsets and right. have no access to work you know, at quote unquote home are going into Egypt saying, oh, look at these poor women right. who are secluded in their homes and wearing these scarves and the scarf becomes the most visible right. uh, signifier, right. right, of this oppression that we must come in and now save again same old thing, save these poor brown men, women from their brown from men, men right. right? So white men saving brown women from brown men, right? <laughs> so you have that in the colonial discourse of the veil in the engagement between Europe and you know, uh, Islamic countries or Muslim majority countries, right, right. right? So that's one strain of it. And then on the other hand, within the context of the US, of course we have this very difficult and fraught relationship between black and women of color feminists right. and the mainstream second wave white feminist movement, right? So Audre Lorde and you know, all these critiques of the ways in which black women are silenced, marginalized in that discourse of mainstream feminism. Right. So that also comes into play too. And, and it's interesting in this moment because now we're starting to see interesting fissures around black and white feminists 
mm -hmm. um, around perceptions of anti-Semitism. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that whether it's March Alice, thing. so whether it's the Women's March or Alice Walker, and, and you wonder, you know, w w what kinds of things, right, will be needed to actually build around that, right. you know, at this stage. Right. Um, you mentioned the way that, for instance, um, feminism has been used to shame mm -hmm. women in Islam about their relationship to Islam and, and the perceived role that women have within the religion. Right. I mean, there's there's you know kind of example after example, both in kind of speaking with young Muslim women that I have, and in literature, there's a wonderful novel uh, by a, a, a professor of comparative literature at University of Arkansas named Moja Kaf called The Girl in the Tangerine Scarf, where she has this example of the protagonist who at some point in her life, you know, is, is engaging with these very woke feminists, and she's constantly being told that if she wants to still be Muslim, she can't be woke or conscious, right? right? How right. can you subscribe to this patriarchal right. ideology, you know? Um, and so there's that aspect of it where Muslim women themselves are like, this religion is vast. Right. right. Just like with any religion, there are extremely kind of progressive and radical and revolutionary teachings. And you, again, are kind of practicing the same type of coloniality upon right. me in my trying to construct my identity than you know, that, that, that patriarchal kind of forces yeah. have done over time. So that, there's that antagonism. There's this constant like Muslim women saying, I'm choosing to wear this scarf. I'm choosing to practice my religion. And you're trying to tell me that I'm oppressed? Right. And it doesn't How dare you? And it doesn't simply dictate the religion is bigger than what you perceive as out of exactly. gender relationships. Right? Exactly. And, and again, this is rooted in, I talk about this in chapter four of the book. There's a particular moment in the United States where you see uh, in 1979, in March, Revolution. right before the right. Iranian hostage crisis right. in December that year there's an Iran there's a women's revolution in Iran and this is the first time the US media really seizes on this kind of image yeah. of the black veil as a symbol of women's oppression and you see white feminists kind of rising to the cause and saying, oh, we have to go save these poor right. women. Right. You know, let's go there. Right. And it, it becomes this opportunity for white feminists like Kate Millett and even Gloria Steinem, you know, writes this long passage about it in Ms. Magazine, talking about we need to go global. We need to take this movement global, right? And so you see all these kind of convergences of the ways in which Muslim women are produced as a cause celeb right. for you know, white Western feminists in a particular moment in time that coalesces with oil politics, with changing relationships between the US and the Middle East, and with racial politics in a moment in which black feminists and other women of color feminists are being sidelined right, in the right. feminist and breaking movement. breaking away from Exactly. Right. So right. This all, is a year after Kabahi. Right. Exactly. 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 Right. So all this is happening too, and that kind of persists to this day. These, all these different things are happening when you see the ways, in particular, African-American Muslim women are sidelined yeah. from the conversation around Muslim women, um, all these things are happening. Kind of the history of uh, anti-blackness within the feminist movement, the history of uh, anti-Muslim sentiment in kind of colonial mentalities. Yeah. You know, so all of this is coming together and producing these, these, these ways that politicians and you know, Trump, you know, oh, yeah. you know, she's not talking. She must be oppressed by her husband, these right. kinds of things that get said. The final chapter in the book, you go in a different direction, talking about Maya Bo um, and this kind of interesting move of, of women in Islam and environmentalism mm -hmm. and urban farming. Um, tell a little bit about that story. Yeah, that's actually really where my, my head and my heart is at right now, too, in thinking about this topic, because we live in this moment of intense um, ecological crisis. Yeah. And I think so many of us scholars and activists and otherwise are thinking about ideas of healing and regeneration and regrowth and emergence as kind of ways of figuring out how to move forward. Yeah. On a, on a number of fronts. And one of the central arguments in the book is that being Muslim, it has never been a static thing. It's never been the same across time and space. It's always been circumscribed by the political context at hand. And Muslim women, 
throughout what I call this affective insurgency, have always lived their identities as Muslims in a way that is an absolute kind of uh, uh, engagement yeah. with the societal context around them. So in this moment, you know, in this moment of environmental, you know, catastrophe and crisis, and we see kind of hurricanes and floods right. like right. every single day, and we actually can see uh, what's happening because of, you know, late capitalism's yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, destruction on our earth. I see Muslim women like Maya Blow in California and otherwise uh, all over. And, and again, I, I kind of even want to extend it beyond Muslim communities, kind of people of faith, yeah. people who are involved in progressive religious movements, really engaging with the idea that reconnecting with the earth, regenerating the soil, trying to grow and, and, and find food sources that are outside of the market, right, are critical not only to our own survival and regeneration as a species, yeah. as humans, yeah. um, but also is an integral part of practicing justice in our everyday lives. And so for people like Maya Blow on this farm called Soulflower Farm in the Bay Area, I see this, what I call this insurgent tradition of women of color and Islam in which she and others like her are once again responding to the political moment at hand and taking a lead yeah, in yeah. creating these types of spaces, not only, again, not only for themselves or their families, but for their communities and always having a larger purpose. Like how we talked about with the Nation of Islam, like they were doing this domestic work, but they always thought they were doing it in a way that would bring about kind of strength for their communities right, and right, a future, right, a right, future. And right. that's what I think people like Maya and other Muslim women and people of faith are doing right now, kind of thinking about how to reconnect with the earth to try to build those spaces for us to survive. We've been joined today by Professor Sylvia Chan Malik, uh, who talked about her wonderful new book, Be a Muslim, um, published by New York University Press. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great okay. time. Thank you. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black